Uh, Vic Knoll had asked me to pick a topic that I thought might be of interest to this group uh, in the building primarily. And one of the things that we get asked all the time is, you know, first of all, do we invest? And we tell people yes, but investment is not the whole story for the Inventures Group. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit. But more importantly, uh, startup companies, early stage companies need to think about what kind of investor is most appropriate for them. And businesses change over the course of their lives dramatically and so do their funding requirements. And in this building we've got a fair spectrum, a fair diversity of different companies at different stages. So I'm going to walk through uh, in fairly short order a lot of the designations that you'll hear talked about when people are talking about investment. Um, and there are no solid lines. You'll find that some people talk about seed capital the same way they talk about angel capital. Uh, so don't think that there are any hard and fast rules. But I want to give you a sense of what the landscape looks like. And let me start just by giving you a little bit of background. You just heard um, most of those points. The one that may be more interesting to everybody here is the third bullet. Um, over the last 20 plus years, I've raised over $100 million. And it has come from pretty much every category of investor that I'm going to talk about today. So um, I'm happy to give you as much insight as you'd like to get on each of the different categories and what they look for. Um, I have started one or two companies over the last 30 years. Uh, that's a list. And the list also includes a comment about their status. So for example, my first business, which was started in 1981, Advanced Refractory Technologies, was sold. It was sold to Tyco, um, but that doesn't mean that it's gone or forgotten. In fact, if you drive down Hurdle Avenue uh, near the post office, you'll see that there's a sign out front that says CERMET. CERMET is a successor company to ART. They bought the Buffalo operations from Tyco sometime in around 2003. They still employ a number of the people that I hired and that began their careers at ART. And so one of the things that I love about being an entrepreneur and starting companies is the fact that even when companies are no longer in existence, that doesn't mean that they have lost their economic impact on a region. And so many of the companies that you see here, whether they're sold, whether they're closed, or whether they're still active, are still having an impact on Western New York and the Buffalo area. And that's an important thing, and I think it's part of the reason that we're excited to be here in the Innovation Center and working with companies that are trying to get started, already started, trying to grow, because we know that whether they succeed or not in their current iteration, they're likely to have an impact on the local economy, the ecosystem, uh, and that bodes well for Western New York. So the Inventors Group, as you just heard, is a venture investment and strategic advisory firm. What does that mean? Well, we're not strictly an investment company. In other words, we don't simply act as an investor in startup, early stage, or growing companies. In fact, we don't invest in any company in which we are not an advisor. So if you're looking for strictly cash from an investor, which I'm going to tell you is the wrong thing to think about anyway, you don't want to talk to us. And conversely, if we're advising a company, working with an organization, helping a team, sometimes serving as interim management for them, we don't have to be an investor. So we can do both. We can do either. But we don't do the investment by itself. And there's a very simple reason for that. Early stage companies generally cannot afford to have a full complement of the skills that they need. And they typically require assistance beyond just having capital. We can provide that on an interim basis. We can provide it on an as needed basis. And because of the experience that most of the partners in the Inventures Group have, we usually can do it very, very efficiently from both a cost as well as a time point of view. So, our view is if we're going to invest in a company and we're going to help them, we're going to create the maximum benefit for ourselves and for the entrepreneur. OK, so let me lay out a couple of relevant facts, the first of which is that starting a new business has never been easier. Um, 
Back in 1981, when I started ART, people thought that entrepreneur was a French word. Um, they didn't really know what it meant, most of them, and uh, thought that it might be a disease, who knew what, probably was a disease. But nowadays, being an entrepreneur, uh, with the success of companies like Facebook and Google and Angry Birds, Zynga, and all of that, um, there's a lot of visibility and there's a lot of enthusiasm for it. And so, if you're starting a company, you're not alone. Uh, there are a lot of ways that you can get support, and so it hasn't been any easier than it is right now. And in the United States, small businesses represent over 99% of all companies. That's a pretty amazing statistic when you think about it. Um, we hear about very large organizations that have more than 500 employees, but they are actually a significant minority when you think about the economy and employment. And the other interesting thing is that companies like General Motors, companies like DuPont, Dow Chemical, some of your old, staid, uh, large industrial organizations, although they create lots of jobs, the number of jobs that they create per revenue dollar or the number of spin-out jobs that they create in a community is actually much less on a ratio basis than for startup companies. So it's also good for economic development agencies to focus on companies like yours because the multiplier effect that's created is much more significant than if you win a BMW plant in your backyard. But um, I wanna give a little bit of a reality check because when people talk about starting companies and venture capital and all of that, um, they think that every company follows kind of the same trajectory as Google or Facebook or Tesla for that matter. Um, and that they go through a growth phase and they reach a point where the VCs are throwing money at them, et cetera, et cetera. So just some statistics here. First is that between half a million and a million businesses get started each year. Of those, roughly 3,000 receive VC funding. So first of all, you're looking at less than 1%, probably closer to a half percent of the companies that start wind up getting venture capital funding. Now that $24 billion looks like a lot of money, but if you divide it over 3,000 companies, it says that on average, they're getting $8 million, which is a lot of money. But if only half a percent are getting that, and you start to do that multiplication, and you say, so how much VC money can I count on? The statistics aren't particularly good. And the other one is that on average, 200 companies do an IPO each year with overall proceeds of about $40 billion. So just do the mathematics, and it says you have a 0.3 chance of receiving VC funding, which means that 0.3% of $8 million on average, total average, people get $24,000. That is a mathematical statistic, not a meaningful statistic. But that says that's not the way that you want to count on financing your business. And a 0.02% chance of an IPO. So if you do those mathematics, it means that there's a $40,000 net gain on average for companies that start every year getting to an IPO stage. All right, so what happens? This is kind of the um, typical or exemplary corporate growth curve that companies go through, starting at an inception. So you see way at the left, we've got research. And by the way, that thick line is the amount of invested capital um, that you're looking at over time. So your x-axis is the time bar and your y-axis is the cumulative profit or loss. It starts at a break-even point. It starts at zero and it immediately heads down. And it heads down because you're investing money in R&D, um, you're looking at acquiring technology licenses, you're spending time, whether it's in the laboratory or in your garage or in your home office, whatever your business is, you're spending money and you don't have any revenues, so from the outset, you're creating a net loss. And that loss accumulates over time and gets worse and worse. The further along you get, the more success you're having creating your product or your prototype. You're spending more money. It's getting more exciting. 
you're in what's called the valley of death, which is basically that now you've got to spend some real money. Now you need some real investment. Um, the slope of that curve is, is not pretty, and unless you start to commercialize something, which means selling it, whether it's a service, a technology, or a product, and start to generate revenues, that line is going to continue on a negative slope and you will crash and burn. So turning it around and coming out of that valley of death requires capital, even though you're, you're still looking at some kind of positive cash flow there, uh, until you get to a point where you've reached a break even and now you're successful and you're generating positive cash flow, which looks like it would be a fairly standard set of circumstances to go out and find financing for. But it doesn't stop even when you reach that point at the far right and have success. Because you're almost always going to be raising capital. You're going to raise it to start the business. You're going to raise it to fund those initial operating losses. You're going to need to raise it to develop new products and technologies even after you've started to sell products support working capital needs for growth, to grow the business through acquisitions, or to reach an exit. All of those things take money, and usually it's more money than the business is generating. So the backdrop to all of my comments that come next is that you don't stop raising capital pretty much throughout the life of your business, and you have to be ready for that. And that's why picking the right partner uh, for as an investor is very important because it changes over time. So this is that same chart, sort of, you see at the bottom there, the valley of death and the growth side. And then above it, I've kind of given you some chevrons that indicate what the funding continuum looks like um, from pre-seed to seed to early stage and then to series A. And there is a bit of a funding gap. We're not going to focus too much on that, but that red chevron and arrow is the area that the Inventures Group is focused on. Um, it's an area that we see interesting opportunity because of the slope of the growth curve uh, and because there aren't a whole lot of organizations that like to be in that particular funding arena. So how do you partner with the right investor? Well, most of you are looking at that slide and focusing on the word investor. That's why you came down here. You wanted to hear about what investors are out there. Who do I go to to get money? I want you to focus on the word partner because that actually is a more critical consideration when you're looking for capital. You need to understand what are the motivations that someone else will have to part with their hard-earned money or other people's hard-earned money that they happen to manage and give it to you. You've got a great idea. You've got a lot of enthusiasm for it. You may have a track record or you may not, but you need to think about, based on where you are in that continuum that we just walked through, what are the motivations that they have for getting involved with you at that stage? So again, it changes. And at the very beginning, when all it is is an idea, a concept, um, a dream that you have, who do you think the best investor is? It's you. You've got to commit time. You've got to commit your expertise. And most investors later on are going to want to know that you've invested some of your own capital. Now. Almost every entrepreneur has serious limits in terms of how much capital they can actually bring to the table. But if you don't have skin in the game, the question that any follow-on investor is going to have is, well, if you're not willing to put your money at risk, why should I? So overcoming that obstacle in the conversation is very important. And it doesn't have to be significant in the overall scheme of things, but it needs to be significant to you. You need to be vested and invested in your own business and not just with your idea or your time. So think about that at the very outset 
How much are you putting at risk? Have you gone to the bank and borrowed money and personally guaranteed it? Have you used your credit cards to start buying supplies? Have you put some of your savings at risk? Those are all indications to other investors, later stage investors, that you're serious about seeing this thing through and not just gonna up and walk away if the, if the going gets a little bit difficult. All right, the next group, friends, family, and fools. Let's try to avoid bringing fools into this, but they may be part of your friends and family anyway. Friends and family typically come in very early on because their motivation is to help you succeed. Maybe mom and dad really want you to have a job, and this is the way that they're going to help you be gainfully employed by investing in the company that you're starting. They know a little bit about you, your friends and family, or at least hopefully they know a little bit about you, so they've got some confidence in your ability to pull this off. But typically, there's a limit to how much capital this group can put in. And part of what you need to think about if you're going to take capital from friends and family is what is it that they want out? So with later stage investors, as we'll talk about, the interest is in financial returns. And maybe some of your friends are gonna be convinced that they're gonna become millionaires off your great idea if they give you $5,000. But let's focus on the family because that's typically where your first money comes from after your own. What do they want? What do mom and dad want back from their son or daughter? Well, they typically spend a lot of time and energy saving that money, earning that money. What do they want? They don't want you to lose it. That's what they want. They'd be happy if they got a big check sometime in the future, but that's not really why they're doing it. They're doing it to help you succeed, but what they don't want is to have you come back in six months time or whatever and say, I blew it, it's gone, you won't have it for retirement or whatever. I mention that because when you take that money, you need to think about in the back of your mind, if this doesn't work out, how hard is that gonna be to explain to them and what can I do to mitigate the loss of that money? Is it something I can pay back over time? Is it something that my next job is going to allow me to return to them? Their motivation is to help you. Your motivation in taking it needs to be to protect their principal. And then we move on from that group, which typically taps out, my experiences, at about $50,000 to what are called angels. Now, angels are an interesting group. Angels are typically uh, successful business people who have had some kind of exit in their own business. They've accumulated a fair amount of capital. Uh, they are almost always what are called accredited investors. And the way the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States defines an accredited investor is you need to have made $200,000 a year for the past two years and have a reasonable expectation of doing that again in the future or your personal net worth exclusive of your primary residence has to be more than $1 million. Those are accredited investors. So they have money that they can put at risk or they have income that they can draw money from and put that at risk. And angels have different motivations than friends and family. Sometimes it's thematic. Uh, angels may be investors who are looking for um, things that they know about. They may be people that invest typically in software startups, and they understand the software space because they grew a business there, or medical devices, or something else. They can also be motivated by other kinds of uh, uh, impacts that a company will have. So it can be angels that look to support philanthropic or societal causes, things like uh, cures for cancer, or. Uh, uh, some kind of specific disease, and they like to invest in those kinds of activities. Angels can invest alone, and they can invest in clubs. 
Uh, there are organized angel groups throughout the United States. Buffalo has one. It's very cleverly called the Buffalo Angels. Um, that was a joke. Okay. The, uh, the Buffalo Angels actually just announced uh, in the last few months that they had closed on a $1 million, a little bit more than a $1 million fund. And they are targeting early stage companies that need roughly 100,000 to 150,000. So angels typically will go beyond what your friends and family can provide, uh, often up to a couple hundred thousand dollars. Uh, but very typically, the individual angels will be investing somewhere between $10,000 and $100,000. Um, some angel groups will be happy to invest outside the region that they're in, but many of them tend to focus geographically. So for example, the Buffalo Angels will do deals regionally, but they want most of their investments to be in Western New York having an impact here. And part of the reason is they want to keep an eye on it. Um, the expectations of angels, if you're thinking about that, um, is not necessarily the same as again, later stage investors that we'll talk about. They often are doing this for a purpose, for a reason. They're hoping that there will be um, some kind of, of impact from the company. It may be economic, it may be societal, it may be something else. Um, they also are, of course, always looking for a positive financial return, but angels usually are coming in at an early enough stage that they know it's going to be a long time for that to happen, so they're less focused on it than venture capitalists, for example, will be. And they often are much more flexible investors in terms of deal structure and that sort of thing than you will find in later stage uh, investors. So just beyond angels, typically, we talk about seed funds. And there's a blurring between the two. Um, we have several seed funds in the Western New York region. One is uh, Seed Capital Partners, which is affiliated with Z80, the incubator downtown. Uh, out in Rochester, we have Excel Partners, uh, and there are some others. Now, seed funds typically will invest between $150,000 and $300,000. Some will do more and some will do less. But a seed fund is now kind of the first institutional money that you're going to be interfacing with. So when you think about whether a seed fund is a good partner for the financing that you're trying to do, one thing to bear in mind is that this is the first level of investor that really truly is going to be focused on financial returns and time frames. And the reason for that is pretty simple. Seed funds are almost always financed by other people's money. So the seed fund manager, the person you're dealing with, is not writing a check out of their own account. They're writing a check out of a fund that someone else has assembled and it's not their money. They have a fiduciary obligation to return capital to that fund for reinvestment in the future in other companies or for distribution to those partners. So the term sheets, the structures, the arrangements are going to be much different typically than you would see with any of the earlier financings. That means that you're going to now, for the first time probably, have to consider things like, hmm, um, am I permitted to do whatever I want to do with this money or are there specific guidelines to how I'm going to use it? Um, Am I going to have to repay it on a certain time frame? It may be a combination of debt. It may be a combination of equity. Uh, there are a lot of different things that seed funds will do because since they are early stage, they do want to get some return of capital to be able to reinvest or to return to their partners. And they know that it's probably going to be five or seven or 10 years before the company is really going to be ready for an exit or a monetization event of some sort. So they may look for current returns. They may say, we'll give you $200,000, but you're going to pay us 6% dividend or interest out of cash flow, or we're going to get a percentage of sales in the form of a revenue share agreement. Lots of different structures, but again, usually it'll be the first imposition of some real structure on how you operate your business. 
And that will just set you up for the real constraints that occur when you start to talk to any of these groups, the venture capitalists, corporate venture capitalists, and institutions. And most of these groups are not going to be interested unless you can come to them with a fairly compelling story that includes having a product, having a market study, having customers or at least prospective customers who have tried your product or your technology, pretty much a full built out management team, an understanding of your intellectual property, an understanding of other people's intellectual property that might impact how you grow your business. There are a number of things that the VCs will want to check off their list before they will even consider putting together a term sheet. So if you're not at that point and you decide that you want to send out your business plan or your offering document to a venture capitalist, understand that most VCs will receive anywhere from 20 to 50 business plans every week. And most VC funds will probably finance somewhere in the neighborhood of one to two businesses every month. So if you do the math, what they're looking for when they get your business plan is not a reason to read it, but a reason to toss it into the wastebasket. So if you have not reached a level of readiness the VCs will pick up on that very quickly. You won't get the kind of response you're after. Uh, it's not easy to ca capture their attention, even if you can tick off all of those boxes, and we'll talk about that in a second. But don't think that venture capital um, in any city, doesn't matter whether it's Silicon Valley, New York City, Boston, Washington, DC, and certainly here in Buffalo, uh, is the answer to most companies' financing needs. Um, VCs, as we saw in that earlier slide, represent about 0.3% uh, of company financings. So venture investors, typically these guys are looking to put a million dollars or more at work. Why? Well, small VC funds typically operate with $100 million, and they're looking to deploy that in a three to five year time frame, usually closer to three. So even if you take the lower end and you do the math, that means they're going to put $30 million out a year. Um, they don't want to do it in really small bites. They want to do it in one, three, five million dollar bites. So if you don't have a good need for that, a use of proceeds in the story, as I say, you don't want to be talking to venture capitalists. Again, like the seed capital uh, group, they're investing OPM, other people's money. So they're promising pension funds, limited partners, high net worth individuals, that they will return more capital to them than they could get if they put it into a CD or invested it in the stock market. Um, typically, VCs like to claim that they're averaging 35% annual rates of return. That was true in the 80s and early 90s. Um, in the 2001 to 2011 timeframe, the average return of a venture capital fund was about 1%, not particularly strong. We had a lot of events during that time frame, but they will typically look for very significant returns, which again means that they are going to demand of you a lot of performance. So if you're going to be interfacing and taking money from a venture capitalist, the one thing you need to be prepared for are a whole new suite of words and phrases that trust me, you're going to come to hate. Things like full ratchet dilution and negative operating covenants, um, all kinds of things that will impact what you can do, when you can do it, how you can do it, and so forth. Uh, venture capitalists don't want to run your company, but they may not be sure they want you to run it either. So you're going to have to understand that there will be guidelines associated with taking their money uh, that will limit what you're able to do, and they will be very much involved in overseeing that those guidelines are met. Their focus, of course, is on those 
annualized returns, and they will be looking for an exit. So if your business is one where you want to just kind of keep running it for the next 40 years, generating a nice salary for yourself, distributing uh, dividends to your shareholders, even if the business makes perfect sense, it probably does not make sense for a venture capitalist. Most of their funds have 10 to 15 year operating lives, which means when the fund is done, their investment in you needs to be turned into cash so that they can distribute it to their limited partners. Kind of similar to that are institutional investors. This is private equity funds, family fund offices, hedge funds, foundations, and others um, that will take some of their money. And typically, again, we're talking about organizations or entities that have hundreds of millions of dollars and they'll say, okay, we're gonna take 5% of this and allocate it for risk investment. And so they'll typically also want to deploy a million dollars. Often they like to do it side by side with venture capitalists who have done the due diligence on a company, made sure all those boxes I indicated were checked. Um, and so the same kinds of considerations apply there. And then there's, uh, kind of a new, not new today, but more recent uh, version of the venture capitalist, and that's the corporate or strategic VCs. These are groups within industrial operating businesses that are set up <clears throat> to do venture investing and to invest in early stage and startup companies. But what they're looking for is different from a financial VC. They're looking for strategic fits. They want to invest in companies that if those companies succeed, may provide them with a new product or a new technology or a solution to a problem that they've got right now. And because they are typically industrial companies, they've got their own corporate R&D groups, they've got their own sales and marketing and distribution channels. They can be extremely helpful to a small company that wants to grow in overcoming challenges, in entering the market, in getting great credibility uh, with other potential customers. So they sound like a, a great group to be involved with. The problem with corporate VCs is that they will want something besides just the equity uh, piece that they're getting from you. They will want a right of first refusal. They will want an exclusive right to sell a new product that happens to fit with them or something along those lines. And you have to take that into consideration as part of the cost of doing business with a venture, a corporate venture capitalist. Okay, so coming back to this, I highlighted before that there is a gap that we see. The VCs start in that $1 million range. The seed capital um, funds that I talked about typically go up to about 300,000. There may be some that come a little bit further than that. So what about companies that need something in that 300,000 to a million dollar range. Well, right now, there's not a lot of emphasis on that. There's not a lot of options in that space. And to me, it's an interesting space because you're coming out of that valley of death, you're growing, you're, you still haven't recovered the capital that's been invested, uh, but it is an interesting area, and that is the area that the Inventures Group tends to focus on. But as I said before, we don't do that uh, in isolation. We don't do it simply as an investor. Uh, we're looking for companies that may be at that stage where that's the kind of capital that they need, but they need more than just capital. And so if they need advice on their technology, if they need engineering or scientific assistance, operations, marketing, branding, those kinds of things, and Perhaps what they need is someone to connect them up with other investors that would be interested in what they're doing and can provide in the aggregate the kind of capital that they need. So these are some of the things that we do that we bring to the table. Capital is just one of the six boxes that you see there. Um, but to wrap it up, what I want you to think about is when you're looking at who should be investing in your company, make sure in fact that they're bringing more than capital. They may only be writing a check, but make sure they're partners. You want them to have connections, expertise, experience, or some service that they can provide to you. And that happens throughout that continuum, whether it's your family, whether it's your friends, whether it's seed capital funds, 
venture funds or angel groups. All of them have some of this. Make sure that the kind that they have and what they have is appropriate to your business. So with that, I'll wrap and take questions. Thank you.